Hey, it's Dave Brown here, host of Now with Dave Brown on AMI. Check out this latest highlight from the show. It feels like I've been telling you about the all access comedy special for weeks now, because I have. My feelings are correct and authentic. This weekend's the big weekend. All Access Comedy is making its return to the Halifax Comedy Festival. Five comedians from the Penn Disability community will hit the stage at the Spatz Theater. The free taping takes place this Sunday, May the 12th, at 3 p.m. Atlantic time. One of the comedians is Michael McCreary. Michael is also the author of Funny, You Don't Look Autistic, and Michael is sitting next to me in Studio 7. Hey, good morning, Michael. Nice to chat with you today. Nice chatting with you too, Dave. Thanks for having me on. So let's just start with this Sunday, and then I'm going to pick your brain about your career and your journey, and I'm going to ask you the daily poll question and sure. all that fun stuff. But what are you looking forward to about this weekend? Well, I'm really excited because I'm a friend of Jose Peranian, so uh, I'm just looking forward to hanging out with my friend again. So, I mean, that's that's an honest, my honest, <laughs> the most exciting thing about that. You know, that that's one of the things, though, about the comedy scene. There's camaraderie, right? Because whether you've been on tour, whether you've been doing the clubs, whether it's open mics, for whatever reason, the camaraderie just builds and builds and builds. Totally. I am curious how you're feeling about the nature of the show, how tight your set's gonna be, how you might modify it a little bit for the sake of this performance on Sunday. Yeah, I, I just met with the people uh, who uh, run the IDV service uh, the other day, and uh, they were really they were really cool and accommodating, but it was also uh, kind of, uh, when you're in comedy, uh, you're always trying to find more economical language, but also more specific language. Mm. So it was actually kind of talk fun talking to the IDV guys because they were sort of like, uh, "We're sorry if this is annoying, but you got to do this." And I said, "No, this is actually this is actually me making me write better jokes." Because <laughs> <laughs> like that's 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 kind of it. It's like yeah, you know, they should be more evocative and uh, indirect. Where did your comedy journey begin? Uh, I was about 13 years old, and uh, I was doing really bad in school. I, and not for lack of trying, I was just, you know, I, I was just bad at most things at school. And uh, so my mom went looking for just any kind of extracurricular activities that could give me hope. Mm, and mm. she discovered that in Guelph, an adjacent town, I grew up in Orangeville, uh, a little bit north of Toronto. And uh, there was a group called Spark of Brilliance uh, teaming up with another group called Stand Up For Mental Health, where they were running a series of workshops for, uh, uh, at that time, mentally ill folks who wanted to uh, uh, use stand up as a therapeutic tool. Uh, I'm not mentally ill, I'm neurodivergent, uh, and I was also the, uh, the only child in a group full of people where the youngest person was like 25. So mm. uh, David Granier, the guy who ran it, uh, wanted to call ahead of time to kind of go, hey, I, I don't know if this is really a good fit. I think it's cool. I, I love that you have enthusiasm, but we don't normally take kids into the program, and uh, we're also not used to dealing with neurodivergent folks. Like, they, uh, he, uh, David, I believe, is like bipolar too. Mm. Uh, so he says, we're used to dealing with people with schizophrenia, uh, schizoaffective disorders, stuff like that. Uh, not so much people with uh, autism or uh, uh, Down syndrome or FAS or uh, ADHD, OCD, stuff like that. So, uh, uh, I, I, uh, so I ended up just kind of writing some material in anticipation of that, like kind of giving him an idea of my sense of humor, and uh, he thought it was mature enough that I could uh, be a part of it. And so I, I did my first show when I, I think I was 14, and uh, I closed, which was really weird. Uh, because that definitely, that definitely seems a little bit unusual, yeah, right, for the 14-year-old like, closer. Because, because uh, you know, as a neurotic child, I wasn't thinking, like, wow, I must be really good. I was like, well, that's a mean thing to do to a group of adults. <laughs> They're great. You're opening for a an autistic teenager. And I, it kind of puts a target on your back when you, walk, really, into the, when you walk into the scene. I, like, a lot of people, are, you know, a lot of comedians hate kids, and so that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> We're replacing you with a child. And I thought that was really mean thing to do to a bunch of adults <laughs> with whole lives have whole stories to draw upon even though even though so many comedians now tell stories about their kids and it kind of tell it kind of shows that they still don't even really like their kids that much yeah exactly <laughs> no uh it's uh, god forbid my parents do stand up you know so uh so but but david was awesome uh he taught me everything i know now and uh i didn't really do stand up professionally until uh funny enough uh, Autism Nova Scotia was an organization out in, uh, I, I believe, based in Halifax. I hope I'm not uh, uh, getting that detail That's wrong. That's okay. They'll forgive you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, 
Yeah, so, uh, but, uh, so, uh, like, I, I'm kind of sentimental going back out to Halifax because that was, like, my first paid gig. Uh, mm. So that's kind of, mm. that's uh, fun. How did you end up growing and approaching your comedy? How did you end up finding the material? Because I, I imagine what you joked about at 14 is not what you start joking about in your 20s because you go through your own maturation. Yeah, I course. mean, ideally we go through our own maturations. I'm still kind of like 19 years old, even though I'm 40. Sure. But, but that's like neither here nor there. I've gone through an arrested development. But, but I'm curious how your comedy has evolved, knowing that you started in this space around maybe your own neurodivergence and around other people who were trying to use comedy as therapy. How has that guided your evolution? Sure. Uh, well, when I was a kid, uh, the reason my mom suggested I do stand-up was because uh, she read my diary and it wasn't supposed to be funny. Okay. <laughs> but she, oh, no. <laughs> but she was like, this is great. You should do something with this. And I was like, you want to get out of my room. <laughs> But uh, no, so like I got most of my material just from uh, uh, just from like I'd come home from school and I'd be like really like no one gets me and I'd like write that and my mom thought that was a laugh riot. And uh, and so I uh, but no, she was awesome. Basically, she said, you know, there's a lot of these stories like it might be healthier to to, to laugh about this, mm. an old sort of therapeutic mm. cliche. Uh, but it, it, it did help. Uh, and uh, so originally it started as me trying to make the light. It just when you're a kid, you're, you're trying to make things as clean and uh, economical as possible. So as uh, so uh, I, to me, I was like turning stories into one liners. But as I got older, it just got a lot looser and uh, and, and more narrative centric where it's like, you know, people people enjoy a more conversational tone. I found in, in my shows. On, on your website, you describe that you give people, quote, permission to, to laugh at the lighter side of the autism spectrum. How do you go about, how do you go about that? Because again, I'm, I'm a person sure. with a disability as well, sure. right? And I do like to self-deprecate quite a bit about sure. my legal blindness, but I've even been told by folks, you know, that's like, you, you gotta be careful with that because you're supposed to be a positive portrayal and a positive yeah, example. Sure. But I also like to tell the truth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I think if it comes from a real place, that'll register for most people. I think where, where people get offended is when something feels kind of dishonest or you're not speaking from experience. Uh, that That's, uh, like, uh, my my impression. But uh, but uh, when I say provisional laugh, it's exactly what you're talking about, where I'm going, hey, it's, it's cool. Uh, the other tough thing is that autism, despite being a word that is culturally ubiquitous right now, or I don't know if that's even the correct word, but it's just, like, uh, people know the word autism, they know it is of some significance, but most people don't actually know what it is or how mm. it manifests because mm. it's a spectrum, right? Yeah. So everyone on it is a little bit different. And I think what's kind of difficult for people is they're going not only, uh, so it's like not only about giving permission to laugh because it's like, oh, I, I don't want to look like a jerk laughing at someone uh, like with a, with a perceived disability, uh, but because I think people are just going, I don't actually understand the rules of autism. I don't understand the comedic rules about like what is, <laughs> they go, I don't know what this is. Uh, and uh, I know the word and uh, obviously people are going, okay, we've come a long way since Rain Man, so it's not that, it's different, but it's kind of different from person to person. Mm -hmm. So uh, really what I like to do with a lot of my stuff is uh, uh, like try to give people as uh, like, and, and, and I'm not trying to paint in too much of broad strokes, but it is stand up, so it unfortunately yeah, yeah. is kind of that. But I'm just going like, okay, so here are just things about autism, and here is a joke to accommodate that, so it sticks it in your mind, going like, oh, I remember that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But but dipping in your toes in those waters can get a little bit dangerous, right? Like you said, sure. it's hard to paint in broad strokes. Strokes if you're yeah. telling your own story and everybody's disability experience is it their own unique experience. <laughs> yeah. And and I don't mean to start a conversation. <laughs> about the culture war or a cancel culture, because frankly, a lot of those conversations are not very fruitful, but like it is, it is a dangerous game because sure. listen, as someone who talks into a live microphone every day, someone like yourself who finds themselves on stand-up comedy stages or corporate presentations, you sure. just you just never know when someone's gonna be like, I don't agree with that person's truth. Yeah, generally speaking, I think most people, uh, if they don't like something, they're usually coming at it in good faith. Mm. Like uh, usually uh, people are just kind of like, oh, you know, like that, that kind of lands wrong for me. Uh, like uh, to me, I, I try to keep my comedy fairly specific to uh, uh, the very specific. Like uh, I'm gonna say, like uh, 
cultural childhood experiences of like a late 90s early 2000s autistic person so like a lot of the stuff that i'm riffing on are like intense pop cultural fixations that would have been popular at that time so mm. kind of like uh, st what Star Trek would have been to an autistic person in, in like the 60s <laughs> for me would have been like I don't know Spongebob and Sonic the Hedgehog you right, know what I mean right. so, I'm, so I'm kind of riffing on the weird like uh, cultural minutia of the turn of the century through the lens of someone that was like no I was taken hostage by this <laughs> like I, it's not like oh I like these things it's like no I inexplicably drawn to these things and couldn't get on people like why were you into it it's like because it's what I was on when I was a kid yeah, like and I I just happened to have a brain that was wired to latch on to things yeah, you know? and yeah. so uh, so like I, I tried to stay in my lane uh, uh, in terms of subject matter like that like I talk about that as opposed to uh, say like uh, my little brother before he passed away uh, was like uh, profoundly affected in a way where uh, he uh, was nonverbal and needed 24 7 supports and I'll talk about funny stories of things he did to me but I would never make fun of my brother mm. if that makes sense mm. like I talk about I'd always kind of frame him as uh, sort of almost like a Bugs Bunny figure where he's kind of getting one over on me mm. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't feel like I'm punching down because right, I'm like no right. I'm, not, I'm not making fun of uh, him having a radically different experience from me. I'm 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 joking about like a weird story, uh, like yeah, uh, something yeah. that happened. Th that's an expression that that I really that that rolls in my brain a lot when I'm thinking about comedy about punching down because fundamentally the line that we're talking about oftentimes feels like that, right? That, that, yeah. that like what people don't want to hear is somebody picking on somebody else. Yeah, and, and it's tough about when uh, like oh when when uh, you uh, are part of a spectrum because there is this sort of thing of going well are you using the name autism as a license to uh, talk about things that you technically wouldn't mm. <laughs> usually mm. be given permission to talk about because you do not look or act stereotypically uh, uh, autistic and I want to make sure that that is not <laughs> the case it's like no, no no everything I'm talking about is something that affects me I'm not mm. talking about something mm. that would affect someone like my brother why'd you write the book uh, because I was asked to. It was it was really exciting. Like I I was nervous. Uh, I was approached by uh, Anik Press, uh, who are this wonderful publishing house, like Canadian Legends. They published all of Robert Munch's books, and they come up to me and asked uh, if I could write, if I could uh, basically take. Uh, uh, like, you know, just a lot of the stories, uh, my childhood stories, and turn it into a book that was, like, accessible for young, yeah, like, uh, like, uh, like, originally it started as, like, a kid's book, um, but then eventually it was more like a teenage, right. high school kind right. of read. Uh, but, uh, really, that all came about because they just said, could, could you do this for us? And I'm just in a, I've always been in a position in my life where my dad goes, you say yes. Like, if, if they're, if they're paying, you, you just go, yeah. <laughs> okay. I like, I like that there's the caveat And there. then you when figure it out. Yeah. I like the caveat though, when they're paying you, when they're like, paying, when they're you, paying you, you, say you, you say yes. It's like, can you do this? Of course. <laughs> yes is conditional when there's not a couple Queen Elizabeths flowing back, uh, exactly. flowing back the other the other way. Yeah, I, unless it's like the highest stakes job. <laughs> if there's no guarantee of civilian casualties from you doing a bad job, you always say yes. You always say yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm curious as you talk about what that book ended up meaning and morphing into especially in the context of that first story you told about 10 years ago, going into a comedy space and being told, we're not necessarily familiar or comfortable with neurodivergence or we don't have a track record with neurodivergence. How do books like that end up paying it forward for the next generation? Not to accuse you of being a role model, because I think a lot of people in public facing jobs don't like it when they have role model foisted upon them, but maybe trailblazer or someone who's trying to break walls for people breaking barriers for folks yeah that's a great question dave i uh i, I don't really mind the line role model just because i'm kind of going well i mean I, I i can't help if people want to like me you know yeah. and, and, that, and like and that <laughs> that sounds incredibly arrogant but that was not my intention <laughs> uh it was just one of those things where i go well if someone was looking up to me it's not like i can go get away you know it's like yeah. uh, now i I mean, like, it's a responsibility you can take or take or, or not take. And if someone's going like, oh, I kind of look to you as like some sim, uh, as, as, as sort of like a reference point. Uh, and I go, OK, well, I want to make sure I do a good job now. Like, because uh, because uh, I had I didn't have a lot of people to, to, to really look up to in popular culture. And I'm like a. I, I mean, like, I, I love that I have the book and this and that. But I mean, like uh, my. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, my, uh, like, uh, I don't know, I think, I think, like, my most high-profile credit is that I am in, uh, two, uh, three scenes of Ginny in Georgia, one of which I do not speak, you know what I mean? Mm. So it's one of those mm. things where I am hardly, like, I'm not at, like, a Hannah Gatsby level of, like, notoriety. Right, right. <laughs> in the culture, so it'd be <laughs> arrogant for me to assume kind of role model, because I'm going, like, if you, so I'm going, man, I never said I was a role model. People go, you didn't say your name. I don't know who That's you are. <laughs> <laughs> and so, That'll humble you real quick right? exactly yeah. so but but no if someone uh reads the book and identifies with my story and looks up to that then i mean there is a part of me to kind of go well i put that story out there to uh specifically was asked to like uh inspire kids and kind of give them a different vision of what autism uh could be mm. uh and so like uh, there is kind of the responsibility baked in i don't think i properly a answered your question about the book i think the book is even if people haven't read the book, the fact that I wrote the book and the book is about me having the specific job is self-evident of like, uh, hey, we can do the job. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and, and frankly, it's not exceptional that I got the job. It shouldn't be. I mean, like, uh, when I was in high school, I was in a program called Learning Strategies, which was really great because it was helping uh, a lot of kids... Uh, 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 specifically autistic kids, uh, advocate for themselves and take advantage of what we call an independent education plan in, uh, in post-secondary. So it was basically like you were able to dictate the terms of your education. So a lot of the kids in there, including myself, were like, hey, I struggle to focus in a classroom setting because there's a lot of stimuli and there's like a lot of kids, not even necessarily bullying me, there's just ruckus and this yeah, and that. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, so they went, cool, well, we have an education assistant who can go with you to, like, uh, to, like, a cubicle, and you can do your work in there, and it's, like, great, and I can actually learn at my own pace, because I'm reading the, the, the reference materials, uh, it's, like, you know, you do better just reading on your own time, you can kind of, uh, 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 you can kind of teach yourself because I mean like a lot of us would just disappear at like the library or whatever to kind of like we were interested in the subjects you know just mm -hmm. being in class mm -hmm. suddenly you got to front a little bit when you're in front of other t kids because kids are cruel and you're trying to keep to yourself and you're hyper aware of how people are looking at you um, and, and, and you want to make sure you're not calling too much attention to yourself instead of learning which is what you should be doing right right and so a lot of my friends through learning strategies got that and the great thing was that they were able to kind of uh, mold their high school career to uh they were able to tailor it to their special interests so one of my uh friends in high school was really into world war one aviation so he was like how do i get a degree in like in uh, world in, in, yeah exactly <laughs> he was like what, what is the closest thing like how do i get a job as a tour guy and they're like oh okay well you gotta take you gotta take civics and careers and he's like okay and it's like and you gotta take x academic yeah yeah base level things but they gave him the the, the 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 classes that he needed. He, he got the credits he needed yeah. to apply for stuff, and now he gives tours at an aviation museum in Caledon. Uh, and so, he's awesome. So I mean, to me, I always like that's kind of. So I like to think my book exists in that vein of going, hey, it is possible. You know? Yeah, you just have to light the pathway. Sometimes you have to have some sense of what the pathway is. Yeah, because a lot of people go, you should broaden your horizon. And I go, that's that's not true. But I mean, <laughs> you're only saying that because uh, because he got a doctor's note. And, and yeah, like, right. Because because everyone else, it's like it's like my. my, my like, like my son loves baseball. It's like great, but if that kid was autistic, you go, man, you love baseball too much. And yeah, it's yeah. Like, no, <laughs> no parent has ever been like, wow, my kid's way too into sports. It's like, <laughs> I, I go, no, if if the kid is autistic and wants a sports scholarship, you should be going, okay, what are all the credits they need? Yeah, yeah. and what are the universities or programs that, exactly. that end up that end up offering some of those scholarship opportunities? Uh, Michael, this is there's a reason why DJ is MC on Sunday and not me. One, he's funny and I'm not. Two, You're he's, very funny. Thank you. He's much better at handling a broadcast clock, and I've taken you way over time, and therefore the show way over time. <laughs> so I have to say goodbye to you. But before I do, uh, you're up to a lot of different stuff, whether it's documentary, writing, corporate presentations, stand-up yeah. comedy. What are the points of contact to a follow along with you? And then I'll plug the Halifax Comedy Fest at the end. Uh, totally, totally. Is that is that my camera? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can find me. I don't know if this is. Real. That's your, I made yeah, it weird that's now. your camera right there. If you want to stare down the barrel. Okay, no worries. Uh, you can find this. Oh, this put on your 3D glasses as I say this to you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, you can uh, find me uh, on Facebook at Michael McCreary hyphen funny. You don't look autistic. That's also the title of my book. Uh, you can uh, uh, reach me directly at my website aspiecomic.com in the. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what the section is. I think it's reach out or email me. Contact I, I, I can't me, say contact, contact me, et cetera. Us, it is, oh, there yeah. it is. Wonderful. Uh, the <laughs> other thing is um, uh, I have a book, Funny You Don't Look Autistic, which you can find at Anik Press. Uh, uh, I, I think their website is anikpress.com. I hope that is correct. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, uh, that's where that's where you can find all information about me. Michael, so. safe travels to Halifax. Have a great time this weekend. Would love to connect again down the road. I'd love that. Thanks, Dave. This was fun. That's awesome. That's Michael McCreary. He'll be part of the Halifax uh, Festival, the All Access Comedy Festival at the Spats Theater on Sunday. There are still some tickets available for the showing at 3 p.m. Atlantic time. For more information, visit halifaxcomedyfest.ca, halifaxcomedyfest.ca. And again, Michael's website. I'm going to spell it out for you, A S. P I E comic dot com, Aspiecomic dot com. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI TV or download the podcasts wherever you listen. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI-tv or download the podcasts wherever you listen.